Okay, and the next item of business is a statement by Ivan McKee on building industrial clusters around Scotland's ports. Uh, the Minister will take questions uh, at the end of the statement, so there should be no interruptions or in uh, interventions. And I call on the Minister for around 10 minutes, please, Mr McKee. Uh, thank you, President Officer. President Officer, Scotland has significant strengths in the industries of the future. In re renewable energy and hydrogen life sciences, financial services and fintech, quantum photonics, advanced manufacturing, digital and space. We have genuinely world-leading technology underpinned by the excellence of our academic institutions. And while we have had significant success in building manufacturing clusters of excellence around these opportunities, we recognise that we have much more to do. This Government is committed to maximising opportunities across Scotland's regions and in doing so creating high paying jobs, delivering on our fair work agenda, ensuring everyone is paid at least their own living wage and meeting our ambitious net zero commitments. We will use all of the tools at our disposal to deliver on these ambitions, maximising exports and inward investment, building Scotland's indigenous businesses and supply chains to scale, leveraging public sector procurement and supporting businesses with targeted support and investment. Our vision is of a Scotland which has world-leading capabilities in those industries of the future. Our focus is on high innovation, high wage, high technology opportunities. We are not interested in a race to the bottom in low-cost, low-wage, low-tech manufacturing. Our national strategy for economic transformation will clearly articulate this vision, and we recognise the key role that Scotland's ports and the airports represent in delivering it. President officer, I want to update Parliament today on progress we have made in the implementation of one initiative that will support delivery of this vision, our Green Ports model, and on how we have managed to secure significant additional investment into Scotland to upgrade port infrastructure and build clusters of manufacturing excellence, fully aligned with our fair work and net zero commitments, and on a partnership basis between the Scottish and UK governments. President officer, the UK Government has presented its Freeport model as a dividend of the economic vandalism that is Brexit. We reject that hypothesis. Freeports already exist in many EU member states and indeed did so in the UK within the EU until 2012. We are also well aware of the reputation of some Freeports globally, while also recognising their value in other cases of driving innovation and high technology economic development. This afternoon, President officer, I want to set out our ambitions for and expectations of Scotland's Greenport model. I will explain why, after careful consideration, we engaged an intergovernmental dialogue on an equal footing with the UK Government to improve the Freeport model by introducing a tailored model for Scotland, one which delivers the Scottish Government's requirements, addresses concerns and ensures proper safeguards and enforcement measures. Four principal factors resulted in the recent agreement with the UK Government. Firstly, we negotiated a partnership in which the Scottish Government will have an equal say, both in decision-making and in delivery. This demonstrates our determination to ensure that the influence of the devolved government is strong in collaborative, collaborative dialogue with UK ministers. President officer, this was not on the table previously. Indeed, it is a model that can and should be used in other areas where the UK has recently been all too willing to ride roughshed over the devolution settlement. Secondly, an insistence that bidders must clearly set out how they will embed fair work practices into how they and the companies within the area conduct business. President officer, this was not on the table previously. All applicants in Scotland will be familiar with the Scottish Government's ambitious policies on fair work. Specifically, they will all know about the features set out in the fair work first criteria. Naturally, applicants will want to refer to those criteria considering how as robust a case as possible for designation can be set out. We are crystal clear on this. Any bid that does not aim for the very highest standards in fair work practice, including payment of the real living wage, will not be supported by the Scottish Government. Our commitment to fair work is clear, and this programme will be an exemplar of how we will deliver this commitment. Thirdly, President Officer, we insisted that applicants will be required to set robust plans on how they will contribute to Scotland's just transition to a net zero economy. We have been clear about the need for green pots to be an exemplar of the use of technology and innovation to decarbonise Scotland's economy, to incubate and foster clusters of new green technology and industries and benefit wider supply chains in Scotland. The UK Government has now agreed to this requirement, all the more pressing, of course, in the aftermath of COP26 in Glasgow. President officer, this was not on the table previously. President officer, Scotland announced 17 projects last month. 
Scotland will provide us with enough power for every home in Scotland and create the opportunities for Scotland to build a world-leading offshore wind manufacturing and the export sector. As highlighted in the Strategic Infrastructure Assessment for Offshore Wind, commissioned by the Scottish Offshore Wind Energy Council, which I co-chair, there needs to be greater collaboration between developers, the supply chain and the public sector, both to help focus activity and investment in Scottish ports and to help Scottish suppliers to grow and win offshore wind work. Green ports will support delivery of this crucial objective of securing more offshore wind contracts for Scottish ports. President Officer, my use of the word green is more than semantics. It signals clearly to global investors our ambitions and our unique offering, with our intention to cement Scotland's already well-deserved reputation as a global leading ESG and net zero investment destination. Anyone who engages with investors uh, during COP26 will be well aware of the significant opportunities this presents to Scotland. Finally, the UK Government has now decided to provide fair funding for Scotland. The agreement to invest up to £52 million to create two new designations mean that set-up funding available for England and Scotland will be the same. President Officer, this was not on the table either before. Indeed, it is almost three times as generous as the funding package in the Secretary of State for Scotland's formal offer to me last autumn. On these four criteria, fair work, net zero, funding and an equal say, the Scottish Government has secured everything we sought in these negotiations. On that basis, we are content to proceed with the implementation of the Green Ports model in Scotland. Operation of the model will include the Scottish Government providing investment support through non-domestic rates and land and buildings transaction tax. In addition, operators can expect a wider package of developmental support from Scotland's enterprise agencies, local government and others. I have heard some criticism that the Scottish Government delayed discussions disadvantage in Scotland somehow. President officer, the reality is to the contrary. Any delays are the consequence of the UK Government being slow to come to the table and slow to recognise their specific requirements. Thankfully, that situation was resolved towards the end of last year to enable these negotiations to conclude. President officer, I will not shy away from the fact that the reputation of freeports around the world is mixed, with concerns expressed about deregulation and risks of criminality, tax evasion and reduction in workers' rights. However, that presiding officer is not a model nor an approach to which the Scottish Government would agree. We are optimistic about the potential of the model, but we remain vigilant and focused on firm monitoring and evaluation of progress on the ground. I have engaged with trade unions and others on this matter to ensure their concerns are taken into account, and I will continue to do so. But an equal say in choosing the two designations in Scotland and how they are governed subsequently, I can assure members that this Government will remain focused on ensuring that the high standards on governance and probity are maintained. I would also point to my confidence that our ports, local authorities, businesses and others who will submit applications will be similarly focused. In this element of our partnership work with the UK Government, we will ensure that issues of compliance with the law, governance and management and performance is placed at the top of any hierarchy of priorities. Let me be clear, presiding officer, that which is granted can also be recalled. In addition to the issues I have already covered, we are also conscious of the need to avoid economic displacement, both within and from Scotland. Bidders will be required to make clear what assessments they have made of potential displacement. Scotland's green port model is designed to support the development of innovative industries committed to developing new green technologies fair work opportunities and, crucially, embedding themselves into the local communities in which they are based. Further, we want the areas to assist the development of their regional economies and benefit wider national supply chains. A full applicant prospectus is scheduled for publication next month. The selected designations will take part in a fair, rigorous, open and transparent process. We look forward to considering all applications in the expectation that it will serve to demonstrate the ambition, potential and commitment of the partnerships who assemble them, including local authorities who are central to the bids we expect to come forward. This agreement delivers fair set-up funding for Scotland, demonstrates the negotiating strength of this Government and demonstrates the fundamental importance of fair work, payment of the real living wage and net zero to the Scottish Government and Scotland's future economy. Officer, I will, of course, ensure that Parliament is kept fully up to date uh, on this matter as it progresses. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Minister. The Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow around uh, 20 minutes for that, after which we will need to move to the next item of business. 
Um, those members who haven't yet done so but who wish to ask a question, I'd um, ask them to press the request to speak buttons or place an R in the chat function. And I call on Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank the Minister for advance sight of his statement. It is an extraordinary re rewriting of history. No one has forgotten that having described the very concept of free ports as havens for criminality, the Minister's desperation to find fault with anything the UK Government proposes and his initial reluctance to deal meant Scotland came very close to missing out on investment that could bring, just for example, 22,000 jobs to the North East, as well as an economic shot in the arm of £8.4 billion. People well recall that the Mayor of Tees Valley said in December that people are investing in his area who would have invested in Scotland had the Minister backed Freeport. And it was only when the Cabinet Secretary took personal control of this matter, saying Freeports would deliver a major economic boost, that this moved. Presiding enough, so what we've just heard from the Minister is grudging, is negative, dare I say, petulant, which is hardly surprising, given that it's an open secret the Minister had to be persuaded of the enormous economic value of Freeports from within his own government. So does he really think that he can now, in good conscience, tell the Parliament and industry that he is the minister that can make this Freeport project a success. And furthermore, what will the minister be doing proactively to ensure Scotland is at the forefront of bids and ensure that the negative divisive language of his statement doesn't scare off potential investors? And finally, the minister acknowledges a whopping £52 million investment by the UK government will make these two Scottish Freeports a reality. Will the Scottish Government commit to matching the scale of that ambition for Scotland? Minister. Uh, and actually, it's Liam Kerr, it's uh, rewriting history. The reality is we've been very clear right throughout this process with the ex very extensive engagement I have had with, uh, with businesses, with ports and others, and anyone he talks to will confirm that right through uh, this whole period of exactly where our red lines were. We've articulated that very, very clearly. We identified the risks, as I have done in my statement and as I did previously, around the Freeport model globally. We worked uh, very extensively with, uh, with the team in government and beyond to understand what the opportunities were within this. I've listened very, very closely to, uh, to business as a consequence of that, as I said, through the very extensive engagement that's happened through the course of the last year and a half on this, uh, this, this, this process. Uh, we have uh, been very clear on our red lines, on fair work, on real living wage, on a commitment to net zero, on an equal say in the designation and in the UK Government putting in equal funding to Scotland, as it has done to the ports in England. Um, it's been the UK Government that's been slow to come back to the table. I wrote to the UK Government on the 27th of February last year, 2021, got no answer. I wrote again on the 5th of March and got no answer. I wrote again on the 12th of March and got no answer. I wrote again on the 24th of March and got no answer um, to try and get something away prior to the election period. I wrote again immediately when I come back on the 11th of May to the UK Government, no answer, and again on the 22nd of June last year to the UK and no answer. Six times I wrote to the UK Government government and the silence was deafening. I had a, a discussion with the Ch Chief Secretary of the Treasury, Steve Bartley, back in February, uh, more than a year ago now, where we had a deal laid out, but for some reason UK government pulled the plug on that. It was supposed to have been announced uh, in the budget by the Chancellor, uh, Rishi Shunak, in March of 2021. The UK government pulled the plug on that. The UK government has been disconnected on this internally. They've been unable to come to the table and unable to, 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 to do a negotiation position. In contrast to the Scottish government, myself, the Cap Secretary, the First Minister and others have been very clear and very consistent at every stage of this process uh, what was required in order for us to agree to the Greenport model. And as I laid down, th those uh, red lines have not changed. Thankfully, in November of uh, last year, the UK Government came back to the table uh, and uh, approached us and said that they wanted to reopen negotiations because they recognised that us proceeding with our own Greenport, Greenport model, which is exactly what we were on course to do uh, towards the end of last year, was a suboptimal solution for, uh, for business in Scotland. And they would look very, very stupid indeed had they not committed to, uh, to, to that situation. Minister, That's I've, the reality Minister, can I ask you to wind up the, your and response? Finally, uh, I am absolutely committed to for, uh, FDI coming into Scotland. That is why Scotland, for seven years in a row, has been the best performing part of the UK in attracting foreign investment and continues to do so. Thank you. We have got a lot of questions to get through. I would uh, appreciate more succinct questions and indeed answers. Minister, question number two comes from Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer, and thank you to the Minister for advance sight of his statement. The ability of our two governments to argue about uh, almost every issue means 
Scottish ports find themselves months behind England uh, in taking forward free ports or, or green ports, as the Minister refers. And there still remains a lack of clarity on the fair work requirements. In his statement, the Minister somewhat vaguely said applicants will want to refer to fair work criteria and should aim for the highest standards in fair work practice, but it is not clear what, if anything, will be legally binding. So could the Minister confirm whether or not any successful bids must, must include commitments on workers' rights, including the ability of trade unions to access sites and organise within green ports? And given that the Minister has not even met with the trade unions who represent workers in Scotland's ports to discuss green ports, will he not only do so, but also confirm that any application criteria and fair work will be legally binding and agreed with the trade unions? Now, we know that Green MSPs say they do not support green ports, but can the Minister confirm what the estimated total value of the Scottish Government's financial contribution will be to green ports and whether that funding was included in the recent Green SNP budget? And finally, yesterday, Conservative MSPs ruled out support and bids from around seven out of the nine areas who have so far expressed their interest in green port status, including Cairn Ryan and my South Scotland region. So will the Minister ensure that support in the economies of more peripheral areas, with arguably the biggest economic challenges, will be part of the application criteria. Minister, I am conscious the audio is not brilliant, but I hope you got most of that. Minister. Uh, yeah, thanks. I think I got the, got, the, got the gist of it, and I, and I thank the uh, member for the question. We have been absolutely clear, um, as in my statement today, and right through this process, that fair work and payment of the real living wage are, uh, are, are essential for bids coming forward, um, and uh, as we have secured equal partnership with the UK Government in the decision-making process within that, uh, we have signalled very clearly that bids that come forward that do not meet those criteria, we will not be supporting them as part of that process. That is absolutely clear. Um, we are very proud of the work we are taking forward in conditionality with regards to fair work and the real living wage, uh, and, and this Greenport model is absolutely part of, uh, of that. I have engaged with uh, trade unions extensively through the course of this process, uh, through four separate meetings. Uh, with trade union representatives and a separate meeting with a wider stakeholder group that trade unions have been present at. So they have been very much part of that process and are very clear on, uh, on their, uh, their asks in this regard to protect workers' rights, to protect uh, environmental and other standards and see no degradation um, as a consequence of the model operating. And it is our uh, ambition that the model is, is, is absolutely not a race to the bottom, but as I said earlier, a climb to, uh, to the top. Um, and we are very committed to working with trade unions to continue to do that. The member also raises the issue of displacement. As I said in my statement, displacement is something we are conscious of. We see this as an opportunity to attract more investment, more business and additional jobs to Scotland, not to move uh, business around within, uh, within Scotland. Um, bidders, I have said, uh, will be required to uh, indicate the consideration they have given to the risks of displacement as part of the bid process and how they seek to, uh, to mitigate that. In regards to financial contribution, my uh, colleague, the, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, uh, will be working through the, the detail on that. Clearly, it depends on the, the successful bid because the, the shape of, uh, of the types of businesses that are in the, the, the green ports will obviously influence the, the extent of the, the, the relief that will be, will be in play. Um, but that will be a, an issue not for this year's budget, but for for, uh, for future years' budgets. Thank you. I, I now call Stuart McMillan, who will be followed by Jamie Halker Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Minister provide any further information about the economic incentives that will actually be provided to Green Ports to encourage business growth and economic development? And will any scoring system to decide the two locations fully consider local economic and social conditions? Minister. Yeah, the two uh, green ports will uh, benefit from a, a comprehensive package of support, including additional revenue support to establish government structures and business plans, uh, substantial seed capital for land assembly and infrastructure, reserve tax reliefs in respect of capital, land and structures, national insurance reliefs, customs easements, devolved tax relief in uh, respect of non-domestic rates and land and buildings transaction tax. Um, depending on the plans and the circumstances of the winning bids, we will also look closely at how mainstream economic development support from within the Scottish Government and enterprise agencies could increase the impact on the ground. We will consider whether additional targeted support, for example, in the area of skills development, could also supplement the package on offer. I am happy to confirm that local economic and social conditions will be taken into account in assessing the strategic context for uh, the bid regeneration and job creation will be the lead objectives for this programme. Thank you. Jamie Hunker Johnson, who also joins us remotely, to be followed by Stephanie Callahan. Thank you. The statement claims operators can expect a wider package of developmental support from Scotland's enterprise agencies, local government, and others. Given this, Scottish Government has squeezed the budgets of our enterprise bodies and local councils. 
Is the minister suggesting additional money will be made available to them to fund this support? And if so, how much? And given the progress made elsewhere, can you confirm when next month that application prospectus will be published? What an offer for bids will be opened and closed? And what projection he is working to of when they will be effectively operational? Minister. Yeah, um, thank you for uh, to the member for the question. And, and again, not great sound quality. I think I picked up the gist, um, the, the gist of it. Uh, with regard to funding, of course, from uh, enterprise agencies and others, that will depend, as always, on the, uh, the, the quality of the, 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 um, the requests that come forward and the, for how they are compliant with their strategic objectives and those of the enterprise agencies. So, um, as I say, those, uh, those applications for future funding will be dependent on, uh, on individual circumstances. With regard to the timing around about the bid prospectus, uh, clearly we're working with the UK Government, so both partners having an equal say, uh, we move forward to, together on that. So the, the, the full timetable will depend on us both, uh, both agreeing all aspects uh, of the detail of this, which is well progressed. Um, expect that uh, through the course of March, the bid prospectus will be launched um, and we expect that by the, the summer we will have uh, made uh, decisions, uh, uh, bids will have been submitted and decisions on that will be made shortly thereafter. I thought I would be interested to get uh, the members' reflection perhaps at another point on uh, Liam Kerr's comments that the Conservative Party have decided to support the Aberdeen bid, uh, I'm assuming in preference to bid from Orkney, Shetland and other in, uh, in the regions which uh, the member represents. Stephanie Callaghan to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Thank you, President Officer. As the Minister mentioned in his statement, it is important that steps are taken to avoid the possibility of green free ports displacing economic activity. Can the Minister say any more about steps which can be taken to ensure that green free ports make an additional contribution as opposed to displacing activity? Minister. Uh, as I said in my statement, the Scottish Government will not support any bid that does not feature um, a clear and um, uh, 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 commitment to, uh, to, real, to fair work practices, including the real living wage and other elements in the, the Fair Work First uh, agenda. Um, and we will also be very clear that uh, displacement activity is something that we will look upon uh, to understand uh, within the, the, the bid offers that come forward that this has been uh, considered and mitigation steps are in place to make sure that uh, there are safeguards against the displacement of economic activity. Next two speakers join us remotely. Firstly, Rhoda Grant to be followed by Emma Roddick. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I would like to echo Colin Smith's plea with regard to peripheral communities where the benefits of these designated ports would have a far greater regional impact. But can I ask when decisions will be made about where our allocated free port, green port status and how decisions will be made? And, and agreement reached between the two governments. Minister. Yeah, I thank the member for the question. Um, as I said, the, the process is moving forward at pace, uh, with both governments agreeing on the details of that as we take it forward. I expect that uh, the, the final um, designations, the two designations, will be indicated uh, later this year in the autumn of this year, once we've gone through the full process. The bid prospectus will lay out um, in detail how. Um, how the process will be, uh, will, will be taken forward, how it will be scored, um, and as I say, that will be launched uh, through the course of, uh, of March. Um, and I'm very well aware of the issues that have been raised. Uh, what we're seeking to do with this um, uh, initiative is to make sure that Scotland is able to compete and compete on an international stage, um, and uh, the, the quality of the, the, the bids that uh, come forward will be judged. Uh, on that basis, along with the, the, the criteria that I've uh, already identified. Um, but, of course, we're very conscious of the need to mitigate against displacement and the impact uh, uh, that, that, that uh, the model could have is something we're very, very careful to, uh, to guard against with regards to uh, displacement activity. Emma Roddick to be followed by Maggie Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Minister give any reassurance to ports not in the running to be designated as a free port who are concerned that they might be negatively affected by this move? Minister. Uh, this is a concern that uh, has been raised to me by, uh, by businesses, by ports and others. Um, we believe that what we are doing with the, the Green Port model, as I said, is absolutely the right thing to do to put Scotland in a competitive position um, internationally. Um, but, uh, it, and, and it's my priority also is to make sure that they are beneficial to the national economy and the wider supply chains right across Scotland. 
All ports, of course, are welcome to apply alone or in partnership. When we are clearer later in the year um, where the two green ports will be, then I think uh, that will be the time to have a look at uh, the impact of that designation, how it plays in the wider context across uh, all of uh, Scotland's ports and in the wider ecosystem to make sure that, uh, as the member identifies, ports that are not successful are also supported to take forward uh, their, uh, their business expansion plans. Maggie Chapman to be followed by Willie Rennie. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for advance sight of his statement. He will be aware of the Scottish Greens' very strong opposition to free ports. I won't rehearse all our reasons for that now. But I must make clear that what we've heard today does not do enough to challenge the fundamental functions of free ports, that they facilitate and legitimise tax avoidance, poor labour conditions and environmental degradation. It is not enough that bids will, and I quote, aim for the very highest standards in fair work practices, end quote, we must demand and require companies to meet these high standards. Our workers and trade unions deserve nothing less. Aren't these proposals just a UK government Brexit project that has been greenwashed and will result in tax avoidance and the loss of public resources and commons wealth to the private sector? Minister. No. Um, I know that the Greens are in support of fair work and payment of the real living wage and accelerating conditionality to deliver that. The Green Port model delivers that. I know that the Greens are in favour of um, accelerating our move towards net zero and requiring businesses to, 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 to come forward with plans to deliver on that. This Green Port model delivers that. I know that the Greens are in favour of building Scotland's industrial base so that we can benefit from the, uh, the developments, in particular in offshore wind, but other uh, sectors and technologies that uh, are focused on net zero. This Green Port model delivers that. I know that the Greens are in favour of supporting business where it makes sense to be able to enable Scottish businesses to be able to take advantage of those opportunities. This Green Port model delivers that, and this Green Port model also is very, very clear about no uh, degradation of worker uh, rights or environmental standards. And frankly, I'm a bit perplexed about why the Greens don't support uh, the Green Port model, given it ticks all of those boxes uh, in terms of their requirements for such, uh, such a model. Willie Rennie to be followed by Ruth Maguire. Doesn't, doesn't the last exchange show the complete irrelevance of the Greens in government that they can't have any influence over government policy? The government have got a shocking record in this area. They spent millions of pounds failing to save BIFAB, but now the site owners in Frustrata are recruiting from abroad because the government didn't train enough workers to build the tiny number of turbine jackets that are being built in this country. Is the government going to get anything out of this Freeport Green Board deal, or is it just going to be a repeat of the BIFAB shambles? Minister. Uh, we are hugely focused on delivering and maximising the opportunities from, uh, from Scotland and other opportunities that present themselves as a result of the transition to net zero. Working with uh, my colleague Michael Matheson and uh, myself, uh, I'm heading up uh, a working group that's looking to make sure that we can maximise the benefits for Scottish businesses and that Scottish businesses are well prepared with the capacity, the capability and the skills in place to take advantage of those opportunities as, the, as they come forward. Uh, skills development is absolutely key, of course, to, to that transition and I don't need to rehearse, I don't have the time to list all of the initiatives that the Scottish Government has taken to make sure we have the skills in place going forward to support um, a fair transition to, uh, to net zero. And the, the Greenport model um, is another uh, tool in the box, I've said, another opportunity for Scotland to, uh, to further build on the, the very promising sector we have round about uh, offshore wind, but other sectors as well in that transition to net zero. That's what it's focused on. It's, uh, it's taking forward this agenda. It's delivering for businesses, ports, communities and and workers across Scotland, delivering on the fair work agenda, delivering on economic development and delivering on uh, the transition to net zero. Okay, we've got three more members who want to ask questions in a minute and a half. Um, I'll prepare to go over a little, but I'd be, um, I think I'd repeat my plea for succinct questions and um, as succinct answers as possible. Firstly, Ruth Maguire to be followed by Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Minister how green ports will contribute to the exporting infrastructure an independent Scotland will need. Minister. Uh, our objective is to build Scotland's economy to make it as strong as possible so that when we become independent, we have an economy that can compete internationally, and much of that is already in place. This initiative will help further cement that, enhance Scotland's international competitiveness on those key sectors identified uh, in my statement earlier, where Scotland has genuine global uh, advantage um, and to build our economy to face into that net zero future. And as such, this initiative provides an important platform and an opportunity for an independent Scotland. 
Jamie Green to be followed by Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, President. Officer Greenock on the Clyde Coast has a long and proud industrious history of maritime trade with deep coastal waters, border checks, transport links and much of the infrastructure already needed for such a, a huge uh, investment. We also desperately need jobs and investment. Um, can I ask if the Scottish Government would support in principle a Clydeport bid of this nature and would he work constructively with all parties to ensure that we can bring this much needed opportunity to my region? Minister. I thank the member for his, uh, for his question uh, and, and the very positive nature it's framed in, unlike some of his other colleagues, and I'd be delighted to work with him to, uh, to look at the uh, opportunities within, uh, within his, uh, his region, uh, as I am with, with ports right across, uh, right across the country, um, some of whom I have uh, met with, some of whom I intend to visit over the coming months, and I am always open to, uh, to discussions, constructive discussions in that regard to support Scotland's economic development. I would just be interested to know what Jamie Green thinks of uh, Liam Kerr yesterday committing the Conservative Party to supporting the Aberdeen bid to the exclusion of all others. And Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, President Officer. It is very important that green ports make a beneficial contribution to the Scottish economy in terms of inclusive growth. How specifically will growth be measured to ensure the benefit is accrued to Scotland's balance sheet, given the complex supply chains that could be involved? Minister. It will be critical to ensure that wider supply chains in Scotland benefit from the two new designations. Accruing that broad economic benefit is part of avoiding displacement effects. The applicant prospectus will ask for commentary and bidders' plans in this respect, and also agree very strongly with the point made about the benefits we must deliver for communities around the new sites. I want to see net new jobs being taken up by local people who will enjoy good pay terms and conditions. Thank you very much, Minister. That concludes this item of business, and we will shortly move on to the next item of business.